Hello there, I'm Nick Clark. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, as the death toll rises, the economic cost of the coronavirus is being felt in every market in the world. Oil prices have tumbled, gas prices have halved. We have an exclusive interview with the General Secretary of the Gas Exporting Nations. A few billion dollars spent now to save trillions of dollars later. From New York to Jakarta, we look at the economic cost of rising sea levels. And as the oceans warm up, the extraordinary risks divers in Peru are taking to bring in the catch. Well, as the death toll from the coronavirus keeps on rising, it's not only crippling China's economy, it's having a knock-on effect globally. Formula One's race in Shanghai has been postponed, and this year's Mobile World Congress, half a globe away in Barcelona, has been cancelled. Oil prices have tumbled 20% below their January peaks, raising the prospect that OPEC could cut production again. It's not only OPEC that's feeling the pinch. China has also turned away gas tankers, slashing gas prices in half. And just like oil, there's a glut of gas on the market. Yet, unlike OPEC, there's no collective resolve to control prices. But over the last two decades, a group of 12 gas exporting nations have been working to break the link with oil prices. Right now, 34% of gas is traded on the markets. But despite controlling 70% of the world's reserves, they're no closer to using that economic muscle to control prices. And here's the reason why gas is seen as such an important mix in global trade. While hydrocarbons, like oil, will see a decline in use over the next few decades, LNG is seen as an interim solution to our dependence on crude oil. The problem is, big producers like Australia, the United States and Norway don't take the forum seriously because it has yet to carve out a role. The Gas Exporting Countries Forum is based in Doha and its General Secretary is the former Russian Energy Minister. I caught up with Yuri Centurin and began by asking about the impact of the coronavirus. First of all, I would like to express my sincere condolences uh, with the people suffering from this disease in China, in other countries. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's a great uh, tragedy from my point of view. And of course, I uh, wish a speedy recovery for the ones who are infected. Um, I see uh, that the uh, international community and specifically Chinese government started struggling uh, against uh, this disease. And of course, uh, from uh, on behalf of the GCF uh, countries, I wish uh, them uh, a success in this uh, struggle. Uh, speaking about world global trade, uh, LNG trade, uh, natural gas trade, of course, we feel uh, that uh, this situation impacts uh, negatively, uh, but uh, well, I think that uh, this is again a temporary uh, event and uh, I hope that uh, this disease uh, won't have uh, global complications. Uh, but it already is, isn't it? Because China is saying it's not going to honor contracts. Exactly. Uh, this is a force majeure situation. Any contract uh, between sellers and uh, buyers uh, have got a special clause which is called uh, force majeure. That is uh, some events and maybe situations uh, which are out of uh, the influence of uh, participants of the parties of the contract. Uh, but again, uh, I think that uh, this is a temporary situation because uh, uh, fortunately life uh, uh, hasn't stopped uh, and uh, people will continue living, will continue producing, will continue uh, consuming and uh, will, uh, everything will continue from my point of view. Of course, uh, some delays, maybe some, some postponement and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, uh, speaking about me personally, I don't like to exaggerate uh, the situation negatively. Uh, uh, on the other hand, of hand uh, we should uh, solidify our efforts and uh, we should strengthen our stances uh, confronting these challenges in order to meet these challenges and to overcome this situation. And the prices, uh, they're less than half what they were a year ago. What kind of pressure does that put on producers? Could it put some uh, out it's of a, It's a great pressure. On the other hand, uh, speaking about natural gas trade, um, uh, you see the uh, two-thirds of um, uh, uh, contracts uh, between producers and uh, sellers and uh, buyers uh, from the other side. Uh, this is uh, the contracts... Uh, related to the so-called oil and oil products indexation. It means uh, that uh, oil uh, natural gas producers, uh, they are 
protected uh, from this point of view because uh, there's a reverse side of that medal. Uh, mm, uh, low prices, high prices, and uh, the amount of investments uh, in the upstream, in the midstream, which is crucial, uh, of crucial importance uh, for producers. Fortunately, uh, as already mentioned, uh, two-thirds of our contracts, long-term contracts with oil and oil products indexation. Spe sp speaking about one-third of the products, uh, that is uh, uh, contracts that is spot contracts, uh, short-term contracts, we see, we witness uh, that uh, buyers uh, for the time being uh, try and uh, insist uh, to uh, increase uh, the amount of short-term contracts and uh, they are uh, interested in having uh, spot prices. But uh, this is uh, the situation of uh, rather, um, I can say, uh, we see here some equilibrium or so something like this, but this is a temporary one from my point of view. And as far as the United States is concerned, of course, they, they are not part of the GCETF, and exactly. nor is Australia. Is, is that a problem? Exactly. It's not a problem. Uh, we try to uh, establish the bridges with both uh, countries, with gas producers. We do that uh, through different international forums and uh, congresses and exhibitions. Uh, GCF is invited on a regular basis uh, by the organizers. Uh, so we've got an opportunity to exchange views with them, uh, not only through the mentioned international organizations, uh, forests and exhibitions, but I mentioned, for example, G20. Uh, the United States, Australia, uh, both countries are G20 members, uh, so there's uh, an opportunity for us uh, to discuss matters of mutual concern. Uh, more of that, uh, there's another phenomena um, uh, witnessed uh, recently that is uh, the establishment of the East Mediterranean Gas, uh, Gas Forum, as far as I know, with the participation as an observer uh, of the United States. Uh, so it means uh, that uh, U.S. Uh, and uh, companies representing the country are interested in having regular contacts. When we look at what the scientists are saying that needs to be done to stop catastrophic global warming, uh, then, then, then reliance on gas will diminish as time goes on. How are you preparing for that? We are completely convinced uh, that uh, the quickest and uh, the most efficient, the quickest uh, reply, response to the uh, climate change, uh, that is uh, the extended utilization of natural gas as uh, the mostly, uh, most friendly environmental uh, fuel. I don't like to call it fossil fuel, but uh, this is... Uh, well, it is a fossil fuel. Though, exactly, exactly. But uh, this is uh, the most environmentally friendly fossil fuel, and uh, this is uh, the, quick, uh, the quickest response to this challenge. Uh, I mean, climate uh, changes and struggle against climate changes. This is our idea. Uh, and one more. But, but can uh, I just interrupt you just very briefly? And this please. will be the last point. The, the research group, the Global Energy Monitor, said that the proposed tripling of global LNG capacity uh, risk, risks in introducing decades of emissions of methane, a potent and difficult to monitor greenhouse gas, which is at odds with the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, we uh, studied specifically some alternative scenarios uh, connected with the usage of uh, um, hydrogen uh, as a part of uh, the uh, future uh, natural gas mix. Uh, through hydrogen technologies, uh, we'll be able to reduce drastically the methane footprint of the whole natural gas uh, value chain or chain of production. So uh, this is, for the time being, one of uh, the core uh, activities and uh, core, uh, uh, I can say, matters of our specific scientific interest. I participated recently in some uh, international global discussions devoted to the utilization of hydrogen and hydrogen technologies uh, in connection with natural gas, with methane. They are completely promising. And uh, that's why uh, when I made a statement at G20 gathering of ministers of ecology and energy in Japan last year in June, I stressed specifically upon the uh, blue hydrogen uh, technologies on the basis of natural gas. So in spite of methane character of natural gas, there are a few, a variety of opportunities how to make it carbon less and uh, more, uh, less harmful and more useful for, for the community. Mr. Centurion, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Now, warming oceans and melting ice caps could cause sea levels to rise by more than a metre by the end of the century. And that would affect and displace up to 680 million people living along the world's coastlines. The UK's National Oceanographic Centre projected that flooding from rising sea levels could cost $14 trillion worldwide annually by 2100. The United States will need to spend $400 billion over the next 20 years to improve its flood defences. New York is considering spending more than $100 billion on a storm barrier, to which President Trump tweeted, it's a costly, foolish and environmentally unfriendly idea. The World Bank believes every dollar spent on sea defences can yield between $7 to $10 by preventing costly damage. Well, Indonesia is planning to spend more than $30 billion on moving the capital because Jakarta is sinking at an alarming rate. 90% of the city could be submerged by 2050. Rahila Mohammed reports now from Jakarta. Around 4 million people live in Muarabaru on the north coast of Jakarta. Many stay in unsafe buildings and partially submerged streets like this. Isawati has had to raise the foundation of her home because of high tides and rain that have caused flooding in the area. And that's because parts of Indonesia's capital are sinking. Land and sea used to be the same level, unlike now. Then they started building hotels and roads. That's led to flooding. We keep trying to raise our land higher, but water keeps coming in. Underwater digging and growing development is causing the land to sink in Jakarta Bay. As water is pumped out, the ground gradually subsides. Only 60% of Jakarta's population has access to a piped water service, which means many have to use wells. Flooding is also common, especially during the rainy season. Some of the rivers that run through the city are unable to drain water. In 2017, a powerful deluge hit Muarabaru, destroying hundreds of homes. When the wall broke, I heard a noise like an explosion. Water came in like a little tsunami. My husband was pushed by the water and broke his collarbone. We had to rebuild everything. Parts of North Jakarta have sunk by up to 20 centimetres a year, and several areas along the coast are below sea level. This mosque couldn't be salvaged, now left lying half submerged. The government has since built defences to protect the city's coastline, but they're also sinking into the mud. This giant seawall was built by the government to prevent the sinking, but seawater is still seeping through the cracks. And many here say that without a long-term plan, Jakarta could be lost in the coming years. And parts of a seawall collapsed last month, adding further pressure. Authorities have also tried to enforce restrictions on extracting water and new pumping systems. Experts say it's not enough to save parts of Jakarta from going underwater. It's a fast response uh, against the sinking and the flooding. Yeah. And then, but it is like a painkiller only. So we need to find a cure for a, a real disease, yeah, which is a, a substitute the groundwater exploitation. Yeah. So we ask for a water, a better water management to the government. All the while, sea levels are still rising because of climate change. And many here in Jakarta say they have nowhere else to go. Rahila Mohammed, Al Jazeera, Jakarta. Well, joining us now from London is Svenja Szyminski. She's the head of adaptation research at the Grantham Research Institute on climate change and the environment. Svenja, welcome to the program. Uh, so we definitely have, for a fact, sea levels rising here and tens and hundreds of millions of people are exposed. Tell us more about what coastal communities face and, and the impact on people and the economy. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure talking to you about this. And climate change is really the defining issue of, of our generation. And we see this not as a distant threat, as maybe we used to do a couple of years ago, because it is now, now real and we can see this happening um, around us. We can see the impacts. Um, coastal areas are particularly exposed, not just because of sea level rise, but also of other challenges, so water usage, 
also the fact that a lot of coastal cities, particularly mega cities, at the moment we have around half a bill, um, half of all the global mega cities are in coastal areas. So these are massive and still growing um, sites where people live, where their livelihoods are, and these are exposed from sea level rise. And, right, we and see, when we say they're exposed, that means we're right, talking about now, mass displacement and so forth? Well, this, this depends how well we're getting our acts together, really. I mean, we still have a good chance to actually deal with the causes of climate change and all the commitment that we're hearing at the moment around net zero carbon. That needs to be seen in the context of keeping the impact at bay and manageable. But even if we would achieve what we are currently committed to under the Paris Agreement, which says that we want to aim towards keeping temperature rise up to two degrees warming by the end of the century, even if we would do that, we're still set for sea level rise between 30 and 60 centimeters by the end of the century. And that might sound, you know, not significant, but it is pretty significant. It is much accelerated compared to what we've seen in the past. And these are people's livelihoods that are impacted from floods. In some cases, it will mean that people will have to, to move to other areas. Sorry to jump in there, but the, the trouble is that the kind of adaptation that you're talking about costs trillions of dollars, fine-ish, if you're a rich country. But what if you're a poor country? Who's going to front up the bill? Well, it is a really important issue, and that is part of the negotiations that we see globally. How can we support particularly vulnerable countries, and particularly those countries who've not had the emissions that we have caused in, in the developed world in the past? So how do we support those countries? And there are already significant um, investment flows, funds being made available, but more or less this is pledged rather than spent. So the first task would be to, to make those pledges real and deliver. But the second point is we shouldn't really just see this as a cost. You know, this is also an investment. I mean, A, it's a necessary investment into our future, but it's also a chance to think about how we want to design, you know, society in the future. And that is very much the case also in developing countries. I mean, people who are currently exposed to, they, they have, you know, ambitions, they have a vision of what their future will look like. And, you know, that is an opportunity that we need to assist them to design that and not just um, sort of say, look, you know, this is a problem, we caused it. Um, unfortunately, you know, you're going to be the ones who suffer from it. Of course, there's a great deal of expertise out there, not least from the Netherlands. A lot of countries are turning to the Netherlands. What, have we, what can we learn from mm -hmm. what they've done there over the centuries and, and how they're bringing it forward to the, the, the challenges and risks ahead? I mean, the Netherlands are an interesting case because they've really drawn the lessons from a catastrophic event. This was in the 1950s where they had a really catastrophic flood event. And they draw on the lessons. They made it central to government policy. They made a commitment saying, this can't happen. We can't have anybody dying from a flood. And that became central policy. Um, they've invested. They, but they also, and this is the important part, they have an approach that looks at this more holistically. So yes, they rely on dikes, on the sort of polder system that they have developed, where they actually try and, and stop the water and manage water flow. But they also look at building codes and how you build and where you build. And people, you know, really need to understand that even if you live behind a dike, you know, you can't really feel safe. It needs to be sort of part of your, your psyche that, you know, the water risk is there. Netherlands being very low-lying land. So that's what we can learn from the Netherlands. It's all about momentum, isn't it? And, and what does it do for momentum when you have people like Donald Trump saying uh, rather disparagingly of New York's efforts to, to build flood defense and spending billions on that project? Uh, that it's a very unenvironmental idea what they're doing and you should just pick up mops and, and sweep the floor clean. Well, I think it is really important that we get not discouraged 
but also see that you know this is a huge opportunity. It's not not just an obligation to do it, but also an oblig obligation for you know future generations for us to to see the the positives and the opportunities in this. And I I actually honestly believe that those who are blocking this and the likes of Donald Trump, other politicians, you know they they are running out of you know, arguments fairly soon. And I think if we manage to actually build a more sort of public recognition that A, this is urgent, but B, this is also an opportunity for us to rethink how we want society to, to, to operate and deal with, you know, the future and build our future, then I think there is a good chance to actually, you know, get, get this still reduced to, let's say, below two degrees, which would still be significant, but still be relatively manageable for us as a whole. Svenja Siminski, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Well, as our oceans warm up, stocks of fish are becoming increasingly scarce along coastal areas, which means fishermen in Peru are having to risk their lives to make a living. They blame both climate change and overfishing. Al Jazeera's Mariana Sanchez reports now from Paracas, south of the capital, Lima. Looking for crabs and scallops is not an easy job. 26-year-old Wilber Abasa dives for nearly a minute every time, sometimes five to six hours non-stop. He says finding shellfish these days is difficult. The water is warmer, so the crabs hide underground. There's been overfishing. In the past three years, we haven't found any squid around here. The Bay of Paraca, south of Lima, is an area protected for its diversity. Fishermen are assigned a part of the bay where they can handpick each shellfish, especially scallops. But now the mollusks surface trapped in wheat, consuming more time in catching and cleaning before they can be sold. After 40 years farming shellfish, Felix Pilco says the richness of this bay is being lost. Overfishing and the change of the water temperature has deformed the natural banks. The industrial activity around here also increased and is warming up the water. It's a series of reasons for this bank to be scarce. Peru's coast is among the most productive fishing areas in the world. More than 70,000 families depend on artisanal fishing. They produce at least 65 percent of the fish consumed in the country. Large-scale industrial fishing is also taking a toll on small fishing communities. These fishermen go out at sea for days or they dive for hours, but unlike years before, they say now they don't know if they'll arrive here at the port with enough fish or shellfish to make ends meet. That's why fishermen are putting extra pressure on themselves. Alejandro Ramos suffered a decompression accident that left him with permanent muscle damage. Felix Pilco says they have no option but to dive deeper. We often risk decompression because sometimes we feel we have to run back to the port to sell our products. So we get anxious and come to the surface faster. So now we risk more and sell less. Peru's fishing ministry says it will implement vigilant committees to supervise the quality and amount of seafood harvested. Many poor people turn to fishing indiscriminately as a quick solution to providing a livelihood. Their chance to make money fast impacts on the most superficial stocks. So that's why more divers are risking more. There are more accidents, which are now frequent. Many academics say the effects of climate change on the fish and shellfish stocks is still under investigation. Peru's government is fast-tracking regulation of fishing and shellfish gathering. But already these small-scale fishermen say it is much harder and dangerous to make a living. Mariana Sanchez, Al Jazeera, Paracas, Peru. And with that, that is our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything you've seen, you can tweet me, at Nick Clark Al Jazz is the address. Please use the hashtag AJCTC, or just drop us an email, countertheCost at aljazeera.net is the address for that one. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.net com slash cdc and that will take you straight to our page which has individual reports links and entire episodes for you to catch up on i'm nick clark on counting the cost thanks for joining us the news on al jazeera is coming right up <laughs>